All right. So that brings us to why one of the reasons, big reasons we're here today. We are here to welcome our guest. Would you mind putting the speaker slide up? Um, our guest today is going to be talking about Title IX. Title IX is now this year 50 years old. I can hardly believe it. I'm sure all of you are probably more aware of it than me, but it seems like it was just yesterday in the 70s when um, it came into play. It was a title that said there could be no sex-based discrimination for um, any educational institution that received federal funds. It was groundbreaking and it changed things for people all over the United States. And one of the big areas that we saw that in was sports, but it was not the only area. In fact, that uh, title now now includes uh, things like sexual harassment and assault, and it continues to involve. Our guest speaker today, Valerie Steven, or Simon, sorry, uh, has been working since 2014 in the front lines on Title IX, and she's going to talk to us about the history, where it's been, where it's going, and what goes on on CU campus. Thank you so much. Come on up. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I mentioned that I don't, I don't do the podium very well because I get kind of you know engaged and I want to make sure we're um, all talking to each other. I have 30 minutes total, I think, 20 minutes to talk about things. We could talk 20 years, 50 years about Title IX. There's been a lot, okay? So I just want to preface that now. 20 minutes to talk about, just give you the highlights, ask some questions. I have my contact information at the end. If you have any other questions, um, you feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Oh, hang on. Lost it. Oh, there. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe I'm doing it the wrong way. Yeah, you're going okay. Let's try to go forward. We totally could. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So um, I think it's important. You have my bio, but I think one of the things that's important is to kind of uh, ground me. Um, about where I came, where I came from. Again, I'm just going to spend just a couple minutes because it really, I think, shows to me why I have been very personally and professionally impacted by really civil rights in general. And so keep in mind that Title IX is not just about sex-based discrimination in, in institutions that receive federal financial assistance. That was a great, great uh, preview of that. But it really is a whole host of civil rights issues and really moving us forward as a country, and I feel very strongly about that. I feel very strongly about personally. I was part of the desegregation case in Denver Public Schools from the time I was five, um, all the time that I um, graduated to high school. I worked on segregation cases, desegregation cases at the US Department of Justice. So it's really just been uh, a continuation. Again, Title IX is part of this, but all of these are related in terms of ensuring equal educational opportunity, and that's been really important for me. Um, it's a mission that my entire staff, I think, feels very strongly about. Um, this shows you um, some of where I have led or where I've been, and also why it was important when I first came to CU Boulder, um, as was mentioned in 2013, 2014, um, that really I saw a path um, of an institution wanting to be better, do better, and that's been very important for me to um, involve myself with the University of Colorado, where I started in 2014 as the first campus-wide Title IX coordinator. And now I have a new position um, from the last year or so, which is um, really aligning all of our campuses on the University of Colorado. That's Boulder, that's Denver, Anschutz, and Colorado Springs. And so I now oversee all four campuses. Okay, maybe. Oh, oh sorry. Hang on. Okay. You gotta be very careful. Okay, so this is just, again, it's just a, a quick grounding in terms of um, my position now. The position now, again, oversees all four campuses, so we're really trying to align, again, a lot of the breath practices um, across the campus, so overseeing all the equity offices, oversee university risk management and ethics and compliance. Okay, 
So now we're going to really talk about what Title IX is. I think there's been, um, as you see, it's almost we read about it every day. I mean, almost every day. You see it in the newspaper. You see it in conversations. But this is a reminder of literally 37 words that are Title IX. This is the extent of the actual law passed 50 years ago, um, the Title IX statute itself. We have um, many regulations. We've had many guidance documents on it. But this is the, um, this is the crux of it. Uh, and we talk about it, it's on the basis of sex. That's, you know, that's all sex, okay? It's male, female, some people are not, you know, identifying as either. Uh, on the basis of sex, that's included. Uh, you cannot be denied the uh, participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subject, subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That's very important is that that's the hook about who is actually covered by Title IX. So an institution, K through 12, colleges, universities have to actually receive federal financial assistance. Where this becomes, I think, different, for example, on the high school or university level is that there are many K through 12 uh, schools that are private that do not actually receive federal financial assistance. And so if they don't, they're not covered by Title IX. They're not covered by Title VI. They're not covered by any of the other um, areas of discrimination and harassment under the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And so you have to have that hook. Most, I think all universities and colleges receive some form of federal financial assistance, both public and private. And so they will be covered by Title IX. These kind of distinctions um, are also important when we talk about constitutional protections. I have a slide in here about, you know, we have, obviously, you have to comply with um, civil rights statutes. You also have to comply with the U.S. Constitution if you're public, uh, which is going to be different if you're private. And so you sort of see these, there's different um, levels of uh, requirements. And again, if anybody has any quick questions as we're going along, let me know, and we can sort of address those. Okay. So in terms of um, where, <laughs> long answers, did I hear that? Yeah, there might be long answers. Um, so Title IX, so, you know, we were asked today about, you know, this is uh, 50 years of Title IX. It's a long time, 1972, uh, when the law was passed, uh, the 50th anniversary, there were a lot of um, celebrations. I think there are a lot of things to celebrate. Really, the title of this is Gains and Challenges. So there are a lot of things to celebrate with Title IX. Um, and some continuing challenges, frankly, they're going to be in the same areas. Uh, we've made some great gains in these areas, and we've made, we still have some continuing challenges. Um, some key obligations, and keep this in mind that I think, um, and, my, and uh, the focus today is really, I do a lot of work on gender equity in sports, as well as sexual misconduct um, adjudications. That's where a lot of the, con the, the conversation is right now. But keep in mind all the areas that this is actually applies to, so recruitment, admissions, counseling, financial assistance, athletics, sex-based harassment, and that sex-based harassment, including sex assault, dating domestic violence, stalking, uh, pregnancy. That was a big issue uh, this year in terms of the revised um, regulations that came out or the proposed regulations. Treatment of LGBTQI plus students, discipline, single sex education, and employment. So just think of all the vast areas, think of all the many changes that we have made um, over the last 50 years. Uh, and again, we've made some gains, uh, but we also have some continuing challenges. So what are some of those positive changes? Um, again, I'm gonna focus really on these two big areas um, in terms of gender equity and athletics, uh, and as well as uh, responding and preventing um, sexual misconduct. Um, with respect to gender equity and athletics, um, we happen to have a subject matter expert here in the room. I didn't know she was gonna be here. <laughs> but I think Sealberry um, has really, um, you know, what, how she talks about it, how we've seen this um, in many environments about we've seen so much progress. Um, we've seen teams. We've seen, um, you know, we have an entire um, really process in which we're um, analyzing how to um, really uh, see what there's uh, gender equity in sports. We have um, whether there's participation, you know, we have that now that's required under Title IX. You have, that, have to have that equitable participation in sports. So the same number of uh, females equitably as males in terms of your um, underlying population, you have to have that. That's K through 12 as well as college and universities. So it's not just limited. Obviously, I have a college example here, but you have to have that equitable participation. 
You have to have equitable um, financial aid opportunities for male and female sports. Uh, and you also have to have what we call, um, you know, they call it the laundry list of things, I, that's sort of a strange term, but it's really looking at all the other things that go into a sports program. So uh, lawn, or, uh, locker rooms, that's a big one. Um, uh, uniforms, um, coaching, um, you know, just all the things that go into, there's a whole host of things that go into um, looking at whether something's equitable. Um, and that's where we've made, I think, tremendous progress again, K through 12, as well as universities. Um, and it's really not as much, we don't see as many challenges as we used to, especially when Title IX first um, came out. That was a, that was a major focus, uh, gender equity. Uh, and we're seeing, I think again, a lot of progress in that, um, but challenges remain and we'll, we'll sort of get to that. Um, the other area that I think we've seen um, a lot of the changes is with respect to uh, sexual misconduct. And I think that is where, in particular, our offices on the Boulder campus, the equity offices, that's where you've seen a lot of um, focus area. Um, and these have really, Title IX has really reflected uh, the changes that have come in the federal courts. Really, in the 1990s, federal courts started to determine that a uh, institution um, under Title IX, um, we, oh, you got it. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so, it, as I was saying, in the 1990s, is the federal courts started to determine uh, that institutions who receive federal funding were actually responsible for conduct um, of both their students and their employees. There's a whole host of cases. Um, that talks about this, that even though it might not be the school itself who's doing it, that they are responsible if they were on notice and a school was deliberately indifferent to, for example, student on student sexual harassment. It could be in the form of hostile environment. It could be in the form of sex assault. Um, and this whole host of cases began to make um, institutions responsible for that. And that sort of became um, this other form of sex-based discrimination prohibited by Title IX, that if you, again, were on notice of it, um, and you were deliberately indifferent for it, you were going to be liable. You were going to be responsible for that kind of action. And so you start to see um, the federal courts saying that institutions, again, K through 12, as well as universities and colleges, have to actually respond to this. And so this is where we start to see um, the development of um, both prevention programs to prevent it, as well as to respond to it. And so when we talk about our equity offices on the CU campus, um, all four of them, that's really what they're trying to do, is they're trying to ensure programs that prevent um, these type of incidents, but also respond to it. Um, and another piece that I think has been a tremendous gain is not only, again, the prevention and the response to it, but also the support measures that are really critical when someone is experiencing um, this kind of behavior is, you know, a formal investigation might not be the best way to resolve these kind of matters. So we want to make sure that um, anyone is involved, uh, complainants, witnesses, and certainly people who are accused of these kinds of things have the support measures uh, that they need, and that's very important. And so I think these are some of the gains. Thank you. We're at 10 minutes. And I think that um, we also, when I see these um, slides, I think that's really important is um, part of this also is I think the gain is talking about consent. What is consent? What is it not? Um, and also in capacitation, and especially on a college campus, that interplay, that's the main kind of case that we get, and you can just, you would sort of suspect that just from what you read in the newspaper, is that interplay, especially on a college campus, about consent and incapacitation. And we have a long way to go, and this is always my soapbox, of making sure that our young children, and especially before college, know about these things. We need to be able to talk about sex, we need to talk about consent, we need to talk about inca incapacitation, and all at the same time. Um, because that's when we're going to start to actually uh, move the meter on these things. Okay, I'm not going to... Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I know, I thought I had it. Okay, there we go. Okay, you'll see that there's a theme. Is that the same ways in which we've made gains as we have these continuing challenges? Um, this is just one example on the sports side. This happens to be the NCAA. Uh, tournament from last year. That was the men's uh, setup uh, on the bottom. That was the women's setup uh, on the top. That is one example. I could use a thousand. NCAA, and this is a trick question, NCAA isn't actually, they don't get federal financial assistance. That's a little bit of a trick question because that's not an actual institution, but it's a really good way of seeing the just incredible disparities that still exist 
um, between men's and women's sports. Um, I could have so many examples, publicity, open the Denver Post. If you actually look at how many times they show women's sports versus men's sports, I mean, it, they just don't, they just don't, okay? And I think that's true, you know, even publicity, that's one of our factors when I talk about that laundry list. That's one of the factors is that you have to have that equitable publicity. Um, and so that's just one example. Locker rooms, publicity, they're still, we're still uh, not where we need to go uh, or not where we need to be. And so that's just one example. Um, yeah, question. Could Title IX be used, I mean, the gender equity uh, phrase, can that be used uh, to allow uh, to allow a female to get on a men's football team or a male? Oh, I might have to first see you on that one. <laughs> There's a lot in that question. Um, I don't know, see if you have any thoughts on that. Sorry, I'm going to get out of your way. My thought, technically, if there's a female at a federally funded institution that wants to play a sport and they don't have a women's football team, that technically the coach and she's the lawyer, I'm just the sports person, uh, would have to give her a tryout. Okay. She wouldn't have to make the team. Right. Not you. But have they'd to have to give her an skill. opportunity. Right. And if she was a great football player. Uh, and we've and had that in the past. We have we've had, had that in the past. Female, Some of you may know. Yeah. But I think that's how you get, uh, and, and vice versa, right. men's volleyball, women's volleyball, men's soccer, women's soccer. That there, if there is in, interest, but if there's not a women's football team in CQ, so oh, if there was a strong woman who wanted to try out, she would get a chance. Good. Should okay. by law. That's my interpretation, and I'd go to Valerie to right. if, I, if, if the way that works at CU, I would tell the coach, yes, you need to give her a tryout, and then I'd call Valerie's office <laughs> and make sure that she had my back. Yeah, well, and it's a great question. I appreciate that because under Title IX. Under Colorado state law, we cannot discriminate it on the basis of sex. And so, and how what that means in practice is exactly right, is, is all of this, you know, um, and more in terms of is there interest, is there a team? I mean, here's, a, here's an example. I had a case a few years ago in private practice where um, a student wanted to have a fourth level volleyball team. Okay, there were three, and this is just, a, there's a woman who was alleging that I needed basically a fourth level. So you have like your varsity, JV, C league, B, I don't know how they did it, but it's like the fourth level. There was only three and she wanted a fourth. And she brought a Title IX complaint because she said there's no fourth. And it's like, well, you're interested in that, but there's not actually interest from the rest of the, you know, from the, there's no other people to play and we can't hold up, you know, a fourth level volleyball team because there wasn't enough interest. And that's sort of an example, but it's like, it, it's sort of a whole host of things is what are your existing teams? What's the interest? And that's actually part of Title IX too, is like, are you actually fulfilling the current interest on your campus? Um, and what are the, um, uh, what's the other, uh, uh, teams that are available. So it's, it's, that's, hopefully that answers your question though. Okay, yeah. What about a little more complicated issue that's been in the news and that oh, is, yeah. <laughs> is a male by birth that wants to participate in a female sport, swimming, for example. Yeah, and I might have to have uh, SEALs help on this too. Um, I don't know if you have immediate, I have some legal answers, but there's some, there's some practical considerations too. So I'm gonna start with SEAL maybe with some practical considerations and other, other, other regulations that apply, especially in a college campus. Let's use the microphones where oh, sorry. Okay. audience can well, hear too. Currently, uh, the NCAA- A, the governing body of whichever association the institution is a member of. So if it is NCAA, NCAA has regulations to, to that, uh, that this case would fall under the umbrella. So if it's male transition to female, has to be uh, taking uh, testosterone suppressing hormones for one complete year before they can compete. And that was a situation at Penn. And that was a very uh, high profile case at Penn and, he, and she competed she and won. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of backlash. Uh, but so that's that's not a court case. That's an NCAA, the NCAA regulations, and those are evolving. I mean, they're they're all over the world. In track and field, they have their separate Caster Semenya, uh, 800 meter runner. They th those regulations are just evolving in the last five years. So they're almost test cases. 
Yeah, and thank you, Seal. And I think as a legal matter, again, Title IX, you know, we cannot discriminate on the basis of gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation. And that's a whole other, you know, discussion about what those mean, but we're talking about specifically gender identity right now. And CU's policies protect all of those. So does Colorado law. But exactly to Seal's point, we have not gotten the recent Title IX clarification on this particular issue. Um, and supposedly they're forthcoming. I haven't seen them yet, but it is a very sort of on the on the cusp issue. Um, but that's probably the that's probably the best answer we can give right now. Um, I'm going to just finish, and then because uh, I know we're probably getting close to time. What are we for time? Okay, four minutes. So okay, so I guess this, this is a, <laughs> remaining challenges, and that is definitely one of them. And also um, that we still have way too many incidents of sexual misconduct. This is this is net nationwide. This is worldwide, and we are still trying to figure out. And I, here's my soapbox: is we spend a lot of time, especially in my office, focusing on the response to sexual misconduct, very serious behavior, which of course is very important. But I, we are not spending enough time on the prevention. And that is true with so many of our um, very big issues is trying to stop this stuff before it happens so we understand consent and capacitation before these things happen, before we get in these situations. So I think that's where, that's where I, I would still try to spend as much time as we can. Um, Okay, so um, this is just a reminder, I think I mentioned this before, especially when we're talking about sexual misconduct adjudications, um, Title IX is not a world in and of itself. All of our civil rights laws must be, um, all of our policies, all of our procedures, all of our practices must also be consistent with constitutional protections. This is both the US Constitution, our state constitution. So all of this must be working together. So that means that when we have um, adjudications, they must also uh, protect the constitutional rights, especially of those involved or those accused, because that's what we're really talking about. And just as a legal reminder is that as a student, they have a legally protected right to their education. So if that is going to be at risk, either through um, a temporary or permanent suspension, expulsion, any other kind of deprivation of that right, you have to ensure procedural due process, that you have a notice. I mean, at its basic essence, it's notice of what you're being accused of. And an opportunity to be heard. And we could talk like six years about that as well, but <laughs> that's a very quick, quick. Um, I think we talked a little bit about this is that all of this applies um, when we think of high schools. Unfortunately, I had some middle school cases in my private practice, sometimes the elementary school cases. Um, obviously, there's going to be some age um, issues here and a lot of laws that apply it slightly differently, especially at a state level if you're talking about a minor. Um, but this is all true. It's all true for K-12, and I think that gets lost sometimes, um, but it's all true. All the same requirements that I'm talking about, almost without exception, also apply in the K-12 context. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. <laughs> That's a little video about mandatory reporting. I don't know if any of you are mandatory reporters, but talk to me and I'll let you know. But that's a, that's a CU specific. Um, these are just, again, options for reporting um, if you're on our campus. We, we really feel very strongly that, you know, the purpose of reporting is not necessarily a formal investigation, but to get help for those who need it. The university is very lucky to have an, really an extensive amount of support services, and we really want to make sure that people who are going through this have access to that. Um, and of course, that would include the sex assault nurse examination program um, at Boulder Community Health, which is actually um, a partnership between the OIEC, the chancellor, so the equity office, many county uh, partners to get that actually in Boulder. Ten years ago, we did not have that in Boulder, which is sort of shocking, but uh, that's true. Okay. Where we're looking forward, I just mentioned um, just quickly, is that we did get um, on the anniversary of Title IX proposed new Title IX regulations, um, which didn't really make really significant changes from the last administration, some, but we're going to see yet again some more changes, some more refinement, including what we were talking about in terms of sports, uh, gender identity. I think we're supposedly going to get some soon, but we'll see where those lead. Um, okay, now we'll open it up for more questions. Yes, with these two. Oh, Mike, yes, thank right you. Here. Sorry. Looking backward, um, we know the turmoil that was taking place in higher education in the early 70s, and many of us were, teams. were a part of that. Yeah. Um, was Title IX evolving out of that, or was there even a larger national movement that brought about the 
uh, development mm. of Title IX? What, what led into this significant development? That's a good question. So you're saying like the, the turmoil in the 70s sort of include, like in gender equity, I sort of presume that. Or are you just talking the general turmoil like in the United States in general? Well, a general turmoil on the, on, in higher education and on campuses. Okay. I, you know, I, I don't know if I have a perfect answer for that. I would say that, you know, after Title IX, similar to a lot of, and that's why I made that connection to a lot of civil rights. I mean, I think there was, there was a, uh, the universities, frankly, have been the epicenter of a lot. Right, especially is what we're going through as a country, and I think you, you saw that uh, both in sort of ensuring again equal upper, equal opportunities, um, both in sports, um, other ways, um, just to ensure that students themselves, employees themselves, had equal opportunities, both on the basis of sex, race, all of our protected classes, both federally and as you know the universities are identifying them. So I do think that though you saw, especially with Title IX. You saw you weren't you were not seeing the sexual misconduct side because the, the um, that had not really been developed yet, and so that was sort of 20 years later. But I would say that most of, especially from a legal matter, most of what we're seeing in the 70s, 80s was the gender equity in sports. I mean, that was the almost exclusively. I mean, not exclusively, but that was where we saw so much of the activity, so much of the litigation. And when I was talking about that, that kind of test. They decide about whether there is gender equity in sports, that um, participation, financial aid, those kind of what we call laundry lists, which is locker rooms and um, um, you know um, uniforms, all of those things. Facilities, obviously, is a big one. That's when that was developing, is in the 70s and the 80s. And that's why you know I often use the example as it's sort of like a pendulum. And we see that. And I think we see it go like this a little bit. And we finally landed where, at least as a you know, legal matter, we've decided this is what we decide is equity, and that's how we have that sort of test that we look at. And I would say sexual misconduct is still like this. And we're getting, as you know, and as I know, um, is that each each administration that comes in, kind of we kind of go like this a little bit. And I think, and now, but but the but the it's kind of like this now. Even within my last ten years, it's kind of like this. So I think I think adjudications are going to start to get less like this. Um, but that's I think what's happening in the seventies is primarily gender equity in sports. Did that answer your question? Okay, I think we had a question over here. Yes, hi, thank hi. you. Um, so I, I'm wondering <clears throat> how much Title IX interplays into admissions questions, and does is there any interplay within Title IX around admissions and affirmative action, and does the recent kind of court's consideration of affirmative action as it relates to racial admission policies have any interplay with Title IX and admissions questions? Yeah, great question. Thank you. So I would say not directly, but it's in the same sort of legal realm. Um, I would say that, you know, the admissions questions were um, hopefully, for the most part, settled, you know, over the last few decades. I mean, you saw, you know, prior institutions um, that used to be, um, frankly, all male for the most part, even though there is an exception for that, because we do see some schools that are female, you know, female in particular, some exceptions, and that's actually a uh, allowed by Title IX. But for the admissions, most of that um, we don't see anymore. I actually um, had the opportunity, I was the lead attorney for the United States for the Virginia Military Institute. It's probably one of our most famous cases where um, they did not allow women. Um, and it wasn't a Title IX case, it's a constitutional case, frankly, and what's, what's called Title IV under the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So it wasn't actually a Title IX case, but you kind of see the um, requirements. But that's probably one of the last examples we have of where you know, a state school is saying, I'm not going to allow, we're not going to allow women um, into our state funded school. Obviously, um, so I went to the US Supreme Court and they said, no, you. you you, know, you have to admit women. And so we're not seeing so many of those missions um, issues anymore. Um, but for the second part of your question in terms of how does affirmative action work, you know, what's before you know, the United States Supreme Court now is really not, you know, a lot of the civil rights has to do with, um, you know, if you have a finding of discrimination, whether you have to have a remedial um, measure to actually address a finding of discrimination. And so a desegregation case is a perfect example. I mean, there were, you know, many schools, um, around the country that had a finding of uh, discrimination, such as Denver Public Schools, and they had to um, address that. Affirmative action is where you don't have that underlying finding of discrimination. And so they're related, but in a different sort of legal way. So if that answers your question. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm Mike Brady. So, um, so I love what you said about the civil rights and then the right to education. 
And so it always feels like there should be sunshine in anything so that people have um, confidence in the process. And so my question is, uh, the due, it's, due process is very important to me so that everyone's fair all along the way, you know, so and people understand what they're being accused of and in a timely fashion so that, um, you know, once again, so that uh, everything is out there. And so my question is, could you talk about like the training of the people who do the investigations? Um, can you talk a little bit more about like what the process looks like? Because I think most of us understand the traditional justice system and what happens there. Um, you know, you have a, you know, one side, another side, and there's evidence, or there might be, if it's not evidence, how do you figure out what the truth might be? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here it's um, not very transparent. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, I would say that it is, um, my first, I think, response is, it is the process itself is actually quite transparent because it's all on our website. I, you know, I can forward that to you. In terms of um, where sort of the process is, we don't make the cases themselves public, and that would be probably, you know, well, of course we can't. That's we uh, would not be able to under uh, federal law, uh, privacy law, as well as actually the Title IX uh, regulations themselves. But in terms of, um, you know, the process itself is that we have really, um, if you're talking about a formal adjudication process, um, we really have four stages now. So we have investigated. So and we have. You know, training specific to each stage and staff. So we have um, the investigators. So if we have a formal investigation, the investigators will, um, first of all, we have a notice of allegation uh, that goes to all the parties. So that tells them um, the factual basis for the, let's say it's a sex assault, that will tell them um, all the information and the requirements of what that is, you know, like what has to be in the notice is in our, you know, procedures about it has to lay out certain factors. So we send the notice um, to the parties, that's where the investigators uh, get involved. They talk to the parties, they talk to the witnesses, if they're um, willing to talk to us, we can't compel. That's very different, I think, in our process is we don't have the power to subpoena. We can't require anybody to talk to us. So it's, a, it's an all voluntary process um, and that's included for everybody. Um, so the investigators investigate. They, um, again, talk to all the witnesses, the parties collect any documents and they prepare what's called a preliminary investigative report. And that's really just a summary of all the information um, that they've gathered. They share that with both the parties and their advisors if they have them. Then the parties have an opportunity and they get the entire file. So they get the preliminary investigative report. I'll try to go fast, this is complicated. Um, they get um, preliminary investigative report. They get the entire case file. So they see everything. Um, they actually get it. They get a case file of everything um, the investigators have looked at. The uh, parties get an opportunity to respond to that. Um, and just depending on what they say, there could be further investigation, further interviews, sort of clarifying questions. Once the parties have an opportunity to respond to the preliminary investigative report, then there's a final investigative report prepared. The parties, again, get an opportunity to get the whole file at that point, then they can respond to the final investigative report. This is true at campus, this is each campus too, just FYI, this is all the campuses. Um, and then once the final investigative report is finished, then it is now um, referred to a hearing process. So that's sort of, we have investigator staff. Now we have a hearing officer who's a separate person from the investigators. It goes to uh, a live hearing for cross-examination. We now do it all online. Sort of the, the change to the hearing process was also right at the same time that we had the beginning of our pandemic. And so everybody went remote. So I can't say that we would have had hearings virtually. Uh, that was not something we had considered, but because we all went remote, we started it remote and it's actually worked very, very well. So we have um, live cross-examination. All the parties have advisors. They either have hired their own. Uh, it can be an attorney. It doesn't have to be an attorney, but they can have an attorney if they don't otherwise have uh, an advisor. We appoint one for them. We pay for their advisor. So they go to a hearing process. And then once uh, there's a hearing, if there's a finding of responsibility, it goes to a separate staff for a sanctioning. Um, then there's a sanctioning decision, again, if there's a finding. So that's three different staff. And then uh, they have the opportunity to appeal. This is a separate staff uh, that hears the appeal. And I would say that all the staff both get training uh, kind of inside the university and then outside the university were required to give them training. And if you want to see like an example of our training, if you look for like, for example, on the Boulder OIEC website, you can see a little tab that sort of actually shows you the training that they get. Um, and that's true for each sort of group. Sorry, I'm sorry for a follow-up question. Oh, that's okay. No, that's okay. Um, so, so um, 
because I do a lot of advising at the college level. I'm the guy who emailed you last week, and no, so, I, yeah, you know who I am. And I, so, I remember. No, it's good. It's good. No, no. So, um, so I'm just wondering if that's new because. Oh no, this has been in place for two years at least. Three okay, years? okay, sorry. Yeah. New means two years is new to me. Um, okay. So, because I had one last semester and then I had one about four or five years ago, the process you just went through sounds wonderful. That just wasn't the process four or five years ago, and it had nothing to do with CU. Well, it, so it, I had, no, I have nothing I against that. CU. I just wanted uh, to clarify that I have to follow the laws that are in place at the time. Right, and right, right. So I have to follow. So it, like, and I have to follow obviously. I have to follow state law, and so we've had, diff as I think that was I was mentioning, right. we've had various requirements from from Title IX and, and primarily the U.S. Department of Education, and they have had different views of what that process okay. should be. This sounds great. I mean, I wish what you just described yeah. sounds wonderful. I, I mean, I, I was just saying that that wasn't my experience. So you've changed me, my well, mind. Well, this is why we're here. <laughs> yeah, you changed my mind. You know, because yeah. I have to say it, that felt un unfair. You know, at the time, and I could sit here and talk to you about that case. This 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 individual but what you just described is sounds like a great process and i was hoping my question was a softball anyway i was hoping to give you a, that light because see you you know I, I did um the sexual harassment panel here about four or five years ago my experience with cu has been wonderful and i expected that, yeah, your, I your that. call here would be your, yeah. your presentation would be great too so having said that i also want to point out this may be obvious um but it's not um is a hearing process is incredibly difficult these are most of the people who are in hearing process are students. They are young students going through a very, very challenging process. And so um, the procedural aspect I think is strong and I appreciate that, but I, we are now looking at, you know, as really sort of, are there other ways to resolve issues if the parties are so open to it, you know, alternative ways to resolve these. And I get that question all the time from both people who are accused and both people who are bringing uh, charges against someone. And I just want to point that out, that these are very, very difficult processes, as you would sort of imagine and you sort of see on the criminal side or the civil side. And putting people through that, anyone, is very, very difficult. And if we can resolve those earlier in a way that's a little bit more trauma-informed for everyone, that would frankly be my goal. Because that's not you know, why I did what I do to sort of put students through like this. So. It's right. required, obviously, and, and we need to do it when we need to, but it's it's a very difficult process. So it's well, I'm standing up not to to, to, to to argue in any way. It's just because I'm here to thank you as well. <laughs> thank so you. I'm also the responder. Um, I just want to, you know, you just heard me. Um, I um, had some experience in that. You have described the process why CU is taking it so seriously, and I just want to really thank you for that. I love um, your entire presentation, and on behalf of Boulder Rotary, I want to thank you. Um, <clears throat> back in 1985, uh, Boulder Rotary became involved in the eradicating of polio. There were 350,000 cases of polio back in 1985. Last year, we had two cases worldwide. This year, sadly, we have 30, but we're making a, a big dent in eradicating polio from the the face of the earth. And so on your behalf, Boulder Rotary is pleased to contribute 100 doses of the vaccine to the Polio Plus. Thank, thank you. you very much, Valerie. Very nice. thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank 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 you.